the age of enlightenment. First class is the 17th century foundation, the second session, ancients and moderns, because as I was mentioning to you, the uh, intellectuals of this period were not only well-grounded in classical literature, but in the rejection of the Middle Ages, which will become a significant theme, they turn to the Greco-Roman heritage as their, their main point of focus. Uh, the third session is the Enlightenment as a movement, uh, really a social movement, and their obsession in that movement with the ideas of progress, perfectibility, and, and everything was done with great brio and confidence, as we will say. The fourth section uh, is going to be called the science of man. And we're going to look at the development of the social sciences, psychology, economics, and anthropology, which was a, a central uh, obsession with a number of the Scottish theorists in, in, in the Enlightenment. Session five, we're going to turn to uh, the first wave of critical responses to the Enlightenment, mainly those of Romanticism, or what we've come to call Romanticism, and the, the German movement called Storm and Stress, or Sturm und Drang, uh, which really was a harbinger of early Romanticism. And in the last session, we're going to look at uh, the development of radicalism, which was based on a lot of Enlightenment ideas, and really in the context of the French Revolution, and the conservative reaction to those radicals. Uh, and we'll be looking at people like Edmund Burke and Joseph de Maistre. Anyhow, with, with that said, I just want to launch in, uh, and let's begin with the Middle Ages. And the reason I'm here is because I want to talk about a medieval conception of the universe that was just, not just an intellectual conception, uh, but one that really informed uh, social theory, one that really informed uh, political theory and theories of government, because the 17th century is going to uh, really become a counterpoint to this. But this is in effect a starting point. And the intellectual side of that starting point is the university movement known as scholasticism, the philosophy of the schoolmen. Uh, it was some, it sometimes is called Thomism because Thomas Aquinas had such a huge influence. And we have a, a painting uh, by Gazzoli of, of Aquinas flanked by Plato and Aristotle. And the cornerstone of scholastic philosophy is that the highest form of knowledge was metaphysics, which is really the study of the causes, nature, and classification of being in itself, as they called it. And, and they would be the first to make the distinction uh, using language that was developed really later on, really in the 18th century, and the, the language that we now come to use as noumena versus phenomena, noumena being uh, the reality of the world in itself, the things in themselves, what Kant would have called the ding an sich, not as they appear to perception, those would be the phenomena. So what is perceived are phenomena, what is real in this distinction that they would have made, or the, the noumena. Now, the assumption is that reality exists independently of the observer. No matter what your mind is doing, there really is an outside out there that is real, uh, and that it's first perceived through the senses, but is only fully known through rigorous application of deduction. So scholastic philosophy like to deduce uh, from high level principles, high level axioms that they would begin with and, and then build an orderly structured hierarchical sense of the universe from that. Uh, they lean very heavily on authority and much less heavily on observation. 
they believed that um, authorities from the ancient world, like Aristotle in particular, who is known as the philosopher, uh, that and in, and in Aristotle's own case, he was very much a scientist as well as a deductive philosopher, but they see him as a deductive thinker uh, who's most interested in the essential nature of being in and of itself, not in the, if you will, not in the superficial aspects of things that science looks at as it, as it looks at particulars as it looks at this frog and that toad, rather than the great categories of toadness and frogness, if you will. Uh, the medieval recovery of classical thought ascribed great authority to the ancients. So in the 11th and 12th century, they were very busy translating Greek text, texts from Arab sources in Spain, they got access to the Arabic libraries and, and the School of Translators in cities like Toledo. I've covered this in other courses. You've sat through them with me. And, uh, and they believed that there were superior thinkers, essentially Plato and Aristotle, but not exclusively. Uh, they would, for instance, accept Ptolemy's earth-centered version of the solar system, merely because he was an ancient theorist. And when Copernicus, as we will see, started questioning whether the earth was the center of the solar system, uh, there were many, particularly in the church, who wanted to ascribe uh, the final answer to the ancient authorities. How can you question the masters? They knew more than we did. So, this is all by way of, and you've seen this slide before if you sat through some of the other classes, uh, all by way of saying that the medieval vision of the universe was extremely hierarchical. There were hierarchies of being, in that upper left box, God, angels, humans, animals, plants, inanimate matter, in that order, there's higher and lower. <sighs> just as there is in the a social hierarchy with the king and the pope at the top, and then nobles, then minor nobles, then knights, priests, and monks, then peasants and artisans and merchants, and finally serfs at the very uh, bottom of the social tree. The, this great chain of being, as it was often called, was conceived of as a static God ordained rank. If you were born into a social position, uh, there was no recourse to social revolution. Just as, as if you were talking about the hierarchy of being, a squirrel doesn't aspire to be an eagle or a human or an angel. Uh, your place was determined, your destiny, your virtue was really modeled on how well you fulfilled your destiny for what you were. You didn't try to uh, transcend that destiny. You didn't try to, to move up the ladder. Uh, just so, knowledge itself had higher level disciplines and lower level disciplines. And so you have theology, right of place, because it studies the nature of God. God is the subject. Revelation is the subject. So it's the highest study. Then metaphysics, because it's being studied in itself and its pure essence. <laughs> then there are practical studies like ethics, politics, and law, which look at ideal human values. And then physical sciences in the bottom place. So observational science, biology, physics, chemistry, these were the lowest forms of knowledge. And it was, by definition, uh, something that would not have been really studied in universities, even though the Franciscans of Oxford did have uh, some scientific labs, and they were somewhat interested in physical science. But at the University of Paris, for instance, or at Bologna, or any of the other great continental universities, physical science would not have been studied except for medicine. 
because there it had a, a, a practical application and would have been seen as a faculty of the same ilk as law was a faculty at those universities. Then moving on historically, come in the 16th century, uh, 15th and 16th centuries, but, but the, the, most of the damage, if you will, is done in the 16th century, come two great challenges to the medieval worldview. And the first one, oh, I'm going to ask people to mute themselves. One, two, one, three, six. Oh, let me. Yeah, if you could all make sure you're muted. Um, okay. The. I'm just setting up my screen a little better here. Okay, so the first challenge to this grand medieval scheme of things was the Renaissance movement uh, called the uh, called humanism, the studia humanitatis, the study of the humanities, and it was a secularist movement. It was a movement that called into question the primary religious worldview that, that would have made the Christian enterprise of trying to redeem one's soul uh, the center of, of attention. It replaces that vision. And indeed, in the, in the development of Renaissance art in those three works that you see in the middle of the slide, there are three depictions of the same religious reference, the lamentation of Christ uh, with the women around him, Mary, the two Marys, uh, after he's been taken down from the cross. And you see in the early medieval version, it, they're, they're almost stick figures because the focus is not on uh, the human body. It's not on the person in a representational form, and it's on the message. And the message is the, the Christian message of salvation. And so art in the period is very little trouble with, with representationalism. But when you see by the time of Giotto in the 14th century, and I can actually here make these a little larger for you. In Giotto's version, uh, you see sort of a halfway point where uh, the human response has full character for the first time, uh, as opposed to the, the, the medieval version on the left, where all you get are these icons of sorrow. And then finally, the Montaigne, with this uh, body of Christ done in, in dimension, uh, you're in the late 15th century, and, and here the person of Christ himself is to be um, engaged in the work of art. So suddenly there is this kind of, it's still a religious theme, but there's this secularist aspect to it. So the Italian Renaissance, it revives Roman literature an artistic style, and it led to a change in the curriculum of study, the study of humanity based on Roman attitudes, on ethics, politics, and art. The focus changed just instead of reading St. Augustine and, and St. Paul and other fathers of the church, all of a sudden they're reading Cicero and they're reading Tacitus and they're reading letters of Roman politicians to their brothers, and, and they're getting a, a, this depiction of secular life um, that really would have been nowhere in the medieval world. It isn't that the documents were suddenly discovered. All these documents were there. It's what a given period chooses from the trove of available sources to pick to study. And, and what they pick is based on their interests and based on their, their, 
their Weltanschauung, their, their vision of the universe, their worldview. So what we get is a rejection of scholasticism by Renaissance humanists, the dialectical uh, logical exercises of scholasticism is considered pedantic in the Renaissance period. If we go to Florence in the year 1420, uh, you would have found no one studying scholastic sources, no one really reading Aquinas closely. There's an interest in ancient wisdoms, uh, traditions of magic, astronomy, and alchemy, all of which see the universe as a text to be interpreted and unraveled. And the reason I stress this is because alchemy and astrology, for instance, and magic were all as preludes to physical science. When you get to the 17th century, people who are actually legitimate scientists are also astrologers and alchemists. So, so we see that this Renaissance uh, change in focus is going to help lead to the new attitudes towards uh, the pursuit of science. And of course, as we talked about in looking at the paintings, there's the shift in focus from the sacred aspects of the story to the profane aspects of the story, in this case, the lamentation of Christ. The second great challenge to the scholastic medieval worldview came from religion itself, the Protestant Reformation, which in the personages of Martin Luther and John Calvin raise uh, quite a resistance to what had been traditional monarchical authority in a religious setting the papacy is objected to. And the church as a, this huge political institution is objected to. So we get uh, Luther's famous three solas, the sola fide, sola gratia, sola scriptura, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone. We don't need the intercession of a hierarchy of a priesthood, a, a social hierarchy. Protestantism was a direct assault, not just on the papacy, but on an intermediate priesthood. We don't need priests standing between us and our God. Our hearts should be touched immediately and directly. So the very concept of traditional authority is to be questioned. Luther translates the Bible into a vernacular German and says, you read it, it speaks to the heart. You don't need somebody to tell you what it means. You don't need someone to tell you what it signifies. You can, you can commune with the God directly. So there is this, this sense of rebellion from intellectual traditions and from social and religious traditions. And of course, in, within Protestantism, within the radical branches of, of Swiss Protestantism, for instance, there are these multiple contending sects. And, though, and just the fact of that raise an intellectual question about the knowability of truth. Well, who's right? And we have the religious wars of the period uh, leading to the Thirty Years' War. Who, who is right? So there is the spirit of skepticism. There is this sense of relativism, who is right? The Lutherans, the Anabaptists, uh, the humanists. So in the 16th century, we're presented with three movements that had chipped away at the orderly universe of the medieval mind. And just to sum the two we talked about and add a third one, we had the humanist revival of Roman models with their secular, skeptical, and relativist cast of mind. We have the Protestant revolt against the Roman church and tradition. And I'm gonna add a third, the voyages of discovery, which by the 16th, by the late 16th and early 17th century led to the setting up of the great trading companies with Asia, the, the East India companies, 
of, of Holland and, and London, which brought Europeans face to face with peoples of utterly different cultures and worldviews. Western reality, the contours of the accepted world and what, what was normal and what was real and what was taboo and what was expected and what wasn't expected, all that is called into question. And there were enough people, there were enough intellectuals around who were sufficiently astute to understand that, that these other cultures were not necessarily what they what the majority of their fellow Europeans would have thought of as inferior. The ones who got um, to China and Japan realized that they were in India, realized that they were dealing with uh, very sophisticated intellectual systems of the world that just had very little in common with the European traditions. So what grows out of this? Well, there is this parallel development that has always been, if you will, in the background, but now is picking up steam by the time we get to the 17th century, and that is experimental science. And the greatest, um, if you will, flowering and the most challengingly significant development in science and physical sciences in this period is the astronomical theory that the sun is the center of our solar system, heliocentrism, as opposed to geocentrism. And it comes to the fore because science is less interested, physical science really doesn't have a place for ultimate absolute uh, answers answers with conviction. What it has is probabilities. What it has is explanations for how something works, not why it works or what ultimately it is in the great chain of being. Scholasticism valued what and why, getting to the ultimate essence and purpose cause of a thing, the final cause of a thing as, as the philosophers would have had it. But physical sciences, including alchemy and astrology, they value the how. How does this work? What are the mechanisms? What are the efficient causes, the agent causes? This gear makes that do what? How does that work? Why? Who knows? So you have this universe where people are building mathematical models for the first time. Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei. This is even before the telescopes. And the first ones come about in the generation of, of, of Kepler and Galileo. Even before the telescopes, people say, hey, you know, mathematically, I can explain the movement of the planets better if I put the, sen the sun at the center of these movements. Why? I don't know why. I just know that that is what seems to be the case. I understand the how. So, here we have in the early 17th, late 16th and into the early 17th century, this perfect confluence of intuition, theory, observation, measurement, and technology. And I've mentioned Copernicus, Brahe, Kepler, and Galileo, all of a sudden piggybacking on one another, the, this theory begins to steamroller the traditionalist opposition and the, the, the Jesuits who are trying to defend the scholastic universe are thrown back on their heels um, to the point that the inquisitor of Galileo, uh, Borromeo, at one point, we believe in a private letter, sort of concedes that looks like, I mean, Galileo's got all the evidence on his side but for the sake of the scandal, we just can't, we just can't tell everybody we were wrong. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to introduce the idea gradually. And then in 1620, the Chancellor, the Lord Chancellor of England, Francis Bacon, a not so much a, a scientist himself, 
but as a theorist of the way science works, writes a book about his Novum Organum, a book about the inductive method of science and scientific method in general. And he says it derives axioms from the senses and particulars. In other words, it looks at particular things, not high-end abstractions. And it rises by a gradual and unbroken ascent so that it arrives at the most general axioms at last. Once these particulars have been gathered together, the interpretation of nature proceeds by sorting them. This is what scientists do. We sort them so that they may be presented to the understanding. For no one successfully investigates the nature of a thing in the thing itself. The inquiry must be enlarged to things that have more in common with it. You just don't look at a thing and say, I've got to deduce the nature of this thing. You see, you see a horse and you start asking the question, what are all, how can I organize the animal kingdom into groups that make sense? And do we learn something about that, about the animal kingdom by doing it that way? And ultimately you, you, you wind up with theories of evolution in another 150 to 200 years. Anyhow, so we have uh, this flowering, and this is what I did in that focus on in that prelude to enlightenment class that we did a couple of terms ago. Um, astronomy, biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, I could have included many other faces here, but Kepler and Galileo and Edmund Halley and astronomy, Leeuwenhoek and Robert Hooke in biology, Robert Boyle and his pressure studies, and of course, the great man in physics, uh, Isaac Newton, who develops a theory of classical mechanics. And the significance of this wasn't that it was just a, a breakthrough for scientific explanation, but it was a physical explanation of the universe, a physical, non-theological explanation of the universe. I can explain the universe like I can explain the way a watch works. It's a machine. There are forces. There are laws. We can mathematicize those laws. And by doing so, we can predict. If I can predict the way one object moves through space, I, if, I, if I can do it for one, I can do it for all because it's a law of the way bodies attract. So astronomy and mathematics had previously been regarded as shorthand models that were useful for observing patterns but were not actual physical explanations of the, new, of the universe. But now with Newton, they are. They're explanations. All of a sudden, that formula isn't just a neat little exercise that's useful because uh, it helps explain a pattern, but it has nothing to do with the underlying reality of the thing. Here are people saying, I don't give a hoot about the underlying reality because it can't be tested or known through the scientific method. In the context of the science I'm doing, I can explain those movements as models, physical models, and this is the way they work. The mathematicians, uh, the analytic geometry developments of Napier, uh, Pierre de Fermat, Fermat's theorem, uh, and Descartes himself, the, gr the grand man, the calculus being separately invented and simultaneously in the same generation by Isaac Newton and Gottfried Leibniz, the German, and probability theory, which I, I point out here uh, with Pascal and Christian Huygens, because probability is going to become the byword of, of doing physical science. Physical science doesn't yield answers like I have seen inside the atom, this is the final answer, things must move this way. What I see are patterns and I use big data to say this will happen in X percentages of cases. Um, we saw this battle going on in the COVID epidemic where there were people looking for 
not statistics. They were looking for smoking guns for absolute explanations of things that worked and didn't work, as opposed to looking at the, t- the statistical frequency of outcomes, which is what science really does look at as it builds models. So the breakthroughs in scientific explanation were not possible before, because before there was no mathematics that could chart and describe the behavior of objects in motion. And the foundations of probability that were laid in the 17th century came up to fruition in the 18th century during the Enlightenment proper with people like Bernoulli, who use probability theory and develop a version of the law of large numbers, which literally says um, this will be the case because when you look at enough data, if you expand your, your data set beyond the few, where there could be random outcomes within, within the few, you take 100,000 cases, a million cases, this is what we will find. Anyhow, and of course, science in the 17th century uh, penetrates uh, into social awareness. So it becomes, the scientist becomes a trope. It's not just the astrologer anymore. So in these two Vermeers, these two wonderful Vermeers, always with the Vermeer window in the background, eh? There's the astronomer on the left and the geographer with his compass in hand on the right. And uh, from the high point of the uh, Dutch golden age uh, of painting and to continue with that golden age, we and with the continuation of the social awareness of science, we have this Rembrandt uh, anatomy lesson that Buckman Nicholas told uh, real people real personalities, real men of action, socially known in the world, and they are hard at uh, discovering principles of the human body. And not just done theoretically, but but done through uh, lab study. And and here is that little uh, school around Nicholas Tolk. Anyhow, as we move along, uh, the first great breakthrough, and we had looked at him in, in detail in that one course that we did, uh, is Rene Descartes. There's a painting of him that is ascribed to Franz Hals. They're not sure that Hals actually did it. it, may have been of the school. And he's early in the 17th century. He's deeply religious. He was educated by the Jesuits, but he's disturbed by the wars of religion. This is the age of the Thirty Years' War in his adult um, age. His philosophy embodies characteristic sentiments of the time, and those sentiments are to address the crisis of faith caused by religious upheaval. He would like to to put his soul to rest, if you will, to achieve certainty, the certainty of mathematics and the new scientific approach. He would like all this relativism to to go away, if he could make it, but go away. And he would like to reform what he regarded as the fruitless methodology of scholastic deduction. So his obsession with this pursuit of certainty, he does it in two great works written five years apart, the Discourse on Method and the Meditations on First Philosophy. He modeled his approach on the proofs, the deductive proofs of analytic geometry, begin with axioms that cannot be doubted. So they're more than axioms. First principles that cannot be doubted and then proceed from those first principles to derivative principles that you cannot question. So find a starting point that you can't doubt. And of course, he says, well, to to find one that I I can't doubt, I have to make myself 
into a total skeptic. I'm going to doubt as much as I can doubt theoretically and, and see what that yields, see what is left over. He said, so if we know how illusory the senses are, so let's just reject sensory perception right out of the can. I'm not going to trust sensory perception in any way. Let's be entirely skeptical. And he says, accordingly, seeing that our senses sometimes deceive us, I was willing to suppose that there existed nothing really such as they presented to us. Nothing from the senses can be trusted. The principal error consists in my judging that the ideas which are in me are similar or conformable to the things which are outside me. I have ideas up here in my head. This is a very modern worldview. I've got these ideas. I get these pictures floating through my head, or we like to think of it as our head. And the question I have is, because the assumption that people make in normal common sense everyday life is that these pictures I have are pictures of things as they actually exist out there. But he's pointing out that we have enough evidence about the distortion of the senses not to be able to trust that. So I don't know, I don't even know what is out there in any way. And out of this, he arrives at his famous cogito ergo sum. But immediately upon this, I observed that whilst I thus wished to think that all was false, it was absolutely necessary that I, who thus thought, should be somewhat. Okay, I'm thinking everything is false, but there's still the me thinking the idea that this is false. I'm thinking I may be wrong, but part of that thought is the me that is doing the thinking that I am wrong. And as I observe that this truth, I think therefore I am. So he asserts, the only thing I'm sure of when I say I have this idea is the I part. I think what I, I sense this, this me that is probably making up a lot of false stuff, but it's me making up a lot of false stuff, was so certain and of such evidence that no ground of doubt, however extravagant, could be alleged by the skeptics capable of shaking it. I concluded that I might without scruple accept it as the first principle of the philosophy of which I was in search. And then he goes on through his two books from this first principle and through, through very complicated uh, exercises in deduction, he deduces the existence of innate ideas, ideas in the mind that cannot have been learned from anything outside, ideas of extension, in space, like geometrical extension, ideas of, of uh, dimensionality, the physicality of objects, etc. cetera. Uh, and then he deduces from these innate ideas, the principle of God and even the immortality of the soul as he sees it. So he's satisfied that he has, starting from this standpoint of utter and total subjectivity, He's convinced that he has established the grounds of, of, of certainty that the medieval world lacked. So he, in effect, has reconstructed a sense of the certainty of the medieval world, but he's done it by doing this very modern thing. He's done it inside out. He's made philosophy not about the out there. He's shifted the focus of philosophy to the in here, in the mind. So there's been this total revolution in epistemology, epistemology being the philosophy of how we know things. It's a paradigm shift. For the first 25 centuries of doing philosophy, the idea was here is an object, there's an object, there's an out there, there's a thing. And the question is, how do we know the thing? Traditional epistemology had proceeded from the assumption that the objective world, the out there, 
was known with some certainty, and the question was explaining how we know it. Descartes turns that assumption on its head and assumes that certainty accrues only to the subjective world, the in here. Philosophy is to be done inside out. And as Plato had done, uh, Descartes wants to use mathematics as the model, mainly because mathematics is, is an arena of pure abstractions that are not derived directly as far as Plato is concerned and as far as Descartes is concerned from sense data. Two is two. It is not the apples that you see when you see two apples or the books that you see when you see two books. It is this abstract concept two and the idea had to, for him, had to have been in there. And so he creates this Cartesian, famously Cartesian mind-body split. The seat of knowing where you know is in an immaterial mind, okay, or the soul, as he may have called it, while the seat of sensation is in the material body. So you get, you get stuff in through the eyes, through the ears, etc. For Descartes, they are connected. So somewhere, what you see through the organs of sense connects to the mind. But how this is done becomes a wildly complicated philosophical and epistemological problem going forward. How does it work? The question of whether consciousness is simply brain activity, which would make it body, is consciousness body? Is it, is it a function of the brain, which is another organ, another machine, or is it something else? Is consciousness something else? And right to this day, in the age of uh, so-called artificial intelligence, the question of can we build a machine that truly has consciousness is an active question that computer scientists and philosophers and everybody's got two cents to weigh in, weigh in on. The ancillary modern question of whether the activity of the brain as a machine is physically determined, okay? If, if the brain is simply a machine, a physical machine, and therefore determined like other physical machines, well then, is there free will? becomes another question. So all of the, the, the modern agonizing, philosophical agonizing, uh, is to some degree traceable to this Cartesian moment in time um, where epistemology is subjected to this revolution. And you see in this uh, diagram, this is a diagram for the period, trying to explain how sense data comes through the eyes and makes it to the brain. He thought that the pineal gland was the point at which body and soul met. But we won't, <laughs> we won't go there for now. Now, this tradition, Descartes' tradition of a rationalist epistemology, dominates continental intellectual life, by which I mean Europe without England, Scotland, Ireland, or the Americas, but continental Europe for the next 200 years, 300 years. He influenced much of what followed in continental philosophy. Sensory experience is downplayed in favor of an analysis of mind with the innate ideas and deep-seated mental structures that he implied as early as you know, 1640. That indeed, a lot of what we, we attribute to the world out there is created by or shaped by ideas that are built into the brain or into the mind 
and deep-seated mental structures. So you have this list that I create under this bullet at the bottom of the slide. Leibniz, Spinoza, Immanuel Kant, Hegel, the 19th century German idealists, the 20th century phenomenologists, structuralists, post-structuralists. All these people, uh, Emile Durkheim, the social thinker, Ferdinand de Saussure, the semiotics theorist, Claude Levi-Strauss, the anthropologist, Husserl and, and Merleau-Ponty, the phenomenologist, Heidegger, the existentialist, all that European tradition that likes to examine the mind and try to figure out how we have created a version of the world inside out, uh, proceeds from Descartes and this first great effort. And we'll see what happens to this during the Enlightenment proper. On the other hand, in the 17th century, Anglo thinking, I'll call it Anglo simply because it tends to be English language philosophy, whether it's done in Scotland or whether it's done in, in England or whether it's done in the Americas, uh, proceeds from John Locke, the first of the, the great English empiricists, Locke's book, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, written a generation later, he's a whole generation, more than a generation, he's like 37 years younger than Descartes. It's a deliberate refutation of Cartesian rationalism. And it's the first of, of the, oh, you, yeah, you wanna, there you go. Yeah, thanks for muting yourself. It's the first uh, in a tradition that extends to the great Irish Bishop Barclay and ultimately to David Hume and his radical empiricism. This is the great British development of empiricism in which the argument against Descartes is that sensory experience is uh, the primary philosophical starting point. Locke rejects Cartesian innate ideas and he, is, and he asserts the alternative model that the mind is a blank slate, a tabula rasa, that the mind, everything in the mind is picked up from outside. So he says about innate ideas, some people regard it as settled that there are in the understanding certain innate principles. These are conceived as primary notions, letters printed on the mind of man, so to speak, which the soul, the mind, receives when it first comes into existence and that it brings into the world with it. I could show any fair-minded re reader that this is wrong. Uh, so modern linguistics theory, for instance, the, there's the school of uh, Noah Chomsky, who believed that their deep-seated structures, linguistic structures, indicate that an infant is born with a fundamental apparatus that helps in the picking up of language, and you could never have learned language from a blank slate in the two years that it takes an infant to develop complex forms of syntax and grammar. Um, one could argue, no, Chomsky is in that, that continental tradition of, of innate ideas. But here is Locke speaking for the world as the physical sciences like to engage it and start just with external experience. Let us then suppose the mind to have no ideas in it, to be like white paper with nothing written on it. How then does it come to be written on? From where does it get that vast store which the busy and boundless imagination of man has painted on it? All the materials of reason and knowledge? To this I answer in one word from experience. Our understandings derive all the materials of thinking 
from observations that we make of, and there are two kinds, of external objects that can be perceived through the senses, and he calls that sensation, and of the internal operations of our mind, which we perceive by looking in at ourselves, what he calls reflection. These are two are the fountains of knowledge from which arise all the ideas that we have or can naturally have. Now, for Locke and the empiricists, language, of course, presents a major issue. Words can properly and immediately signify nothing but ideas in the mind of the speaker. Men suppose their words to be marks also of ideas in the mind of the hearer. Men don't often pause to consider whether these ideas are the same as those of the hearers. A man wants his hearers to think that is talking not merely about his own imagination, but about things as they really are. He will often suppose his words to stand not just for his ideas, but also for the reality of things. So the Cartesians, because they believe in uh, innate ideas, it suggests that this idea that I have, certain ideas that I have that are innate, uh, since you are another human being with the, innate, the same innate ideas, we can trust to a large degree that mine and yours will fundamentally agree. But for the empiricists, since I get impressions of things from the world and you get impressions of things in the world, and that becomes the furniture of our minds individually, I don't know that my perception has really matched yours and that Indeed, um, we can really talk about agreement here, or not only agreement with each other, but agreement about what's out there in the world and what's in here in our mind. So in this little cartoon on the right side of the slide, um, there's some apples. And the question is, well, one person says apple and the other person is thinking banana, the pair on the left. But in the pair on the right, there is a kind of agreement. Well, which is it going to be? I mean, all these things become possible in an empirical world. How, what, what is the principle of verifiability in an empirical world? So there's been a revolution in epistemology, objectivity versus subjectivity. For Locke, sense perceptions are what the mind knows, and these arise from accidental qualities then here in things, apples are red and they smell a certain way. Without the device of innate ideas, Locke has no way to ensure that we can objectively know the external world or even share the same ideas through language. He and Descartes both ultimately rely on the belief that God would not deceive us, which is the way they get around the problem, which doesn't work when you get further along and don't include a God in your philosophical hierarchy. The other aspect of, of philosophy in the 17th century that, that has to be addressed by everybody that follows is the mind-body split. Locke cannot resolve the problem of where thinking resides. We have the ideas of matter and of thinking, but possibly shall never be able to know whether any material being thinks. Is it the brain that's thinking or not? It being impossible for us by the contemplation of our own ideas without revelation, without God sending us the answer to discover whether God is not given to some system of matter fitly disposed a power to perceive and think, or else just joined to matter so disposed a thinking or immaterial substance. So we, what is it? Is it that the brain is connected to a soul that's immaterial and does the thinking? Or is the brain somehow the thinking thing? We will see what the world does with this later on. Now, empirical epistemology, the, the English tradition or the Anglo tradition, Locke created the baseline for virtually everything that followed in English language philosophy. 
His ever cautious sense of the inaccessibility of final answers has been a continued theme. So David Hume is going to uh, take it another step further in the 18th century, as we shall see, and, and trigger a, a number of German theorists who have to try to answer Hume. In the 18th century, Locke's empiricism was taken to its logical conclusion. First by Bishop Barclay, who argued that we can never get past perceptions. He's the guy who argued that be, to be is to be perceived. He's the one who also asks the question, if the tree falls you know, in the forest and nobody's there to observe it, has it happened? And then by David Hume, who argued the really radical position that even the mind was an impression. In other words, when, when Descartes or Locke says, oh, I'm going to reflect. I can think of myself thinking. And Hume is there saying, ah, that's just another thought, like the idea of the apple that you saw sitting on the table. It's, it's not different in kind. It's, it's similar. But empiricism and science are naturally wedded. It's a natural fit for the development of the scientific method. Hume pointed out that causes were not observable and that we rely on differing levels of probability. I mean, Hume, he uses the example of the billiard balls and he says, you don't, you know, the cue ball strikes seven ball, knocks it into the pocket. He said, as shorthand, we like to say, well, the cue ball caused the seven ball to go into the pocket. But he points out that you never observe the cause you just saw two events and you made the presumption that because a thousand times in a row, the cue ball hit the other ball and the other ball moved, that somehow you made up this fiction called a causal relationship. But we know from big data that there are things that may happen nine million times out of nine million and one attempts but one case, it might not happen. And, and he said, you never saw a cause. You just count on the idea of cause as a shorthand for different levels of probability. So think of the mystery novels of the 1920s. And I get the Christie with her, uh, the dead body in a room, uh, with all the doors locked from the inside and no windows and a gun, but no perpetrator in the room. Uh, how has it happened? Because it is highly improbable that any of the usual theories are going to explain it, but there's going to be some possible explanation, albeit not very probable, that will get the jack out of the box. So later 20th, 19th, 20th century, 21st century philosophy, logical positivism and linguistic philosophy, analytic, so-called analytic philosophy has addressed the question of whether language is in any way related to objective reality. And in this English tradition, we have people like Bertrand Russell and Rudolf Carnap and Ludwig Wittgenstein and Gilbert Ryle and Willard Quine and John Searle. And there's even an American from Nebraska who's used the methods of modal logic and analytic philosophy to try to do metaphysics again. Um, and that whole tradition derives from Locke. So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a summary in the last 10 minutes here to, to set up what we're gonna be talking about when we talk about the 18th century enlightenment, which is gonna be a, not just about philosophy, but a much lighter set of ideas as we'll see. But the last development in 17th century thought that was a breakaway from uh, the medieval worldview is that government as we got from the middle ages, was rendered legitimate by the authority of 
uh, divine right. There was a God behind the papacy. There was a God behind the emperor. There was a God behind the king. And after the twin revolutions of, of um, the humanism of the Renaissance, and but particularly the, the Reformation challenge to that kind of authority, uh, philosophy and philosophers and political theorists are left with having to explain what is the legitimacy behind any social order. The theory used to be that it was God's intention. It was the will, the will of God and, and, and the will of nature, if you will, as, express, as expressing God's will that put the king on the throne. You do away with that. You do away with all the theory and all the justification of that. You challenge that. Well, then, why should you be running the show? Why shouldn't I be running the show? Why shouldn't we have a revolution? Why can't we, like the English did in 1640, put the king to death? Why can't we rearrange our social rules? arbitrarily, what is going to give authority and legitimacy to any one way of looking at the world? And in right after the throes of the English, still during the English Revolution, Civil War and uh, Revolution of the 17th century, the first to try to answer it is Thomas Hobbes, who is really, when the Civil War begins, is a man who's like 50 years old to begin with. So he has seen it all and he is scandalized that there are these Protestant radicals who question divine right monarchy, who claim that authority derives from covenants or contracts between individual believers based on like church covenants in the Old Testament. And in the new spirit of philosophical rationalism, Hobbes says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he favors having a king. He says, no, 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 no. I want to post, I want to propose an alternative to that theory. He says, I want to look at people and what he calls, and he invents this glorious term, the state of nature. Humans stripped of any historical context that they find themselves in, take, take their civilization away from them. What is human nature deep down? And he says, well, he examines it in his famous Leviathan. He says, basically, people are born more or less equal with no restriction on their right to self-governance. You know, you take away civilization, I've got every right to grab what I can and do what I want. And he says, but, you know, basically individuals um, are relatively physically equal. You know, a few of us can band together to try to overwhelm one who's a little stronger than the rest of us. So we can always do that. And he says, but, but by nature, we are a competitive, acquisitive, and combative race. And we're free to do whatever we want. So he says, if two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies and endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. They use violence to make themselves masters of other men's persons, wives, children, and cattle. And so in this state of nature, it's not a rosy picture for Hobbes. He says, in such condition, there is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And then in his favorite famous phrase, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. You want to know what humans are at base? This is the picture. And he says, so where does political legitimacy come from? He says, to avoid that circumstance, there's only one way out that individuals have transferred the right of self-governance 
to a strong man. What happened is that in the state of nature, people choose a chieftain. And lastly, the mode of an end for which this renouncing and transferring of right is introduced, and it's nothing else but the security of a man's person in his life. The mutual transferring of right is that which men call contract. He says, there's a contract, but that contract is to avoid the frailty and probability of a violent death. So he says, somewhere in the state of nature, there is kind of an original contract. And so the monarch is justified in ruling us because implicit in the society that we see around us is that is that we've all struck a deal. And that deal is um, necessarily to transfer all right that we have to self-govern to this monarch. And that's the deal. A generation later than Hobbes, the English have a so-called bloodless revolution where the uh, Catholic Stuart kings are deposed and the Protestant William of Orange is invited over from Holland in 1690 in a limited role to be king, but the monarchy is going to be limited by the parliament that deposed the last king. And so, uh, in effect, a new constitution is formed in 1690. And the philosopher of the moment in that case is, we are back to uh, John Locke yet again. And, and Locke, it's in the context of a bloodless revolution, removed by an entire generation from the Civil War, and he lives in the age when the of the so-called Whig ascendancy, the, the, the grandees of the uh, parliament uh, have limited the authority of the king uh, and they base their claims on the rights of property. They are the class of the property owners of England. And he rewrites this idea of a state of nature entirely. He picks up where Hobbes leads off and he says, okay, I grant you that men are free and equal in the state of nature. But though this be a state of liberty, it is not a state of license. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind who will but consult it that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So he's going to say, guess what? People have property in the state of nature. They don't need a government. Property is prior to civil society. Though the earth and all inferior creatures be common to all men, yet every man has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. Who, what's, Whatsoever then he removes out of that state of nature, hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labor with it and joined to it something that is his own and thereby makes it his property. So if you grab 40 acres and you start farming it in the state of nature, it's yours and nobody's got a right to it. And the rules of nature, he says, so even if you go into a state of nature and two natives in the Amazon come up against each other and they each have, you know, a string of fish hanging over their shoulders because they've been in different streams, they each recognize, oh, those are your fish because you caught them. And these are my fish because I caught these. And, and even in the natural state of nature, uh, property exists and rules concerning property exist. So he goes on to say, 
on constitutionalism, the right of property and assent of the majority. And thus that which begins and actually constitutes any political society is nothing but the consent of any number of free men capable of majority to unite and incorporate into such a society. And this is that and only that which did or could give beginning to any lawful government in the world. So, so the American Revolution looks back at John Locke and says, well, it's a political revolution, yes, because we've withdrawn our assent, our majority assent to King George III of England and formed our own colonial government. But the laws of property and the social rules that govern us citizen to citizen were not affected by our dissolution of the ties to the English throne. We were a civil society agreed on property. No property exchanged hands during the revolution in that sense. Actually, the property of royalists was, was captured because they ran out of the country. But, but in terms of who were the proper owners of anything, that stayed the same. So this the whole groundwork of liberal democracy is that property is, is this kind of sacred entity and precedes um, government in the state of nature. So you, we're going to see that in the 18th century enlightenment that, that the rewriting of constitutions for monarchies is considered a progressive idea. Let's get in on the action. We, you can change your government without having to rip apart every aspect of the society that you find yourself in. So property in nature is a right, even though if you don't have a government, it's precarious. The great and chief end therefore of men united into commonwealths and putting themselves under government is the preservation of their property. So, um, the theory as it evolves in the 17th century of, of capitalist property, individualism, and empowerment is expressed. It's often called uh, by historians of this period uh, the theory of possessive individualism. Individuals have their properties. This is what is sacred. Any, any just society, any well-governed society is going to be some kind of constitutionally limited system that recognizes the value of individuals and their property. And you can see it in the Dutch paintings. You get the, uh, these two Rembrandts, uh, the syndics of the Draper's Guild, the board of the Draper's Guild, and the portrait of a gentleman. These are substantial citizens of the Republic of the Netherlands. Uh, we'll find cases that idealize this all the way through the 18th century. The 17th century marked a series of political triumphs for the European bourgeoisie. Locke provided the ideological foundation of modern liberal theory, which places the ultimate value on individual liberty and property, or as it will be called in the Enlightenment, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Voltaire's reference to Locke as Le Sage Locke, the wise Locke, aptly captured the sentiment of the 18th century, which saw in the American constitution the consummation of their sensibility. So let's just do a quick summary of everything we've talked about here, because this is all just a background. We, we will get into the more interesting aspects of the course that will not be so packed cheek by jowl with, with so much information. These, these background initial uh, lectures that I give in each of these courses are always the most difficult because there's we, we race through five centuries of, of intellectual development. But let's see if we can simplify it into a couple of uh, quick takeaways. And those are, we began in the Middle Ages, with an idea that there's an intellectual, religious, and political certainty about the universe. It's a static picture of the world. 
It's a hierarchical picture of the world. Then we enter in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, a series of challenges to that certainty, to that authority, to the medieval worldview. And those were specifically Renaissance humanism, with its emphasis on secularism and its rejection of scholasticism. And I should add to that its, its uh, idealization of the individual form and person and personality that you get in the study of the humanities. And then there's the Protestant Refor Reformation with its rejection of the authority of the church and its priesthood and of specifically the papacy and largely of, of a lot of monarchs that it doesn't want to agree with anymore. And the spirit of, of, of secularism and, and the, the spirit of skepticism is in the air. And then we added to that the development of, of, of world view that came out of the voyages of exploration, the cultural relativism that grew out of seeing the world as being a world beyond Europe. And then the development of particularly theories of the solar system that put the sun at the middle, just as, as the individual is now off center in this universe and the European is off center in this uh, international world, so the earth is now off center. Uh, the sun is at the center. There are explanations of the world that have rocked that certitude and sense of special place that we had in the Middle Ages. And that this led to the 17th century developments as background to the Enlightenment development of science and the scientific method, observation, induction, probability theory. It led to Descartes and his focus on uh, rationalism, where philosophy is going to be about reason and the development service to certainty. And, and Locke and the empirical revolution of the English by which philosophy is gonna be based on perception and which is gonna lend itself very strongly to the attitude of the physical sciences. And, and then both Hobbes and Locke developing theories of political legitimacy, contract theory, and theories of property that are going to uh, become the groundwork of liberal social theory, what we, what we like to think of as liberal social theory in the 18th century, where, where property and the uh, burgeoning early period of industrialization are going to be seen, and the development of early bourgeois capitalism are going to be seen as forces for progress in the world, forces for hope in, in uh, what the future, what the future can attain, what the world can be made into uh, with that great, great uh, enlightenment, double vision of looking at to the Greek and Roman past for models of the way we should begin to think about the world and looking towards the future as uh, a potential movement, a potential progression to perfection that will yield and fulfill a, a, a world that would have been the ideal of the ancient world. And, and so in this little cartoon block, it's, it's uh, my little compact argument for what uh, 600 years of intellectual development had yielded uh, as we are on the brink of entering the, the so-called age of reason. And without that, I will stop the share.
and I'm going to remove the pin. And you are all there, my children. Uh, <laughs> are there are there uh, questions or comments or? Hi, Lori. Hey, um, Lou. I have a question about you know many times through your courses you talk about going back to the ancient texts and how that has propelled you know a new movement, a new philosophy, etc. Um, and I'm just trying to come up with something like similar now because we really wouldn't in this day and age go back to the ancient text except you know I can think about some movements you know like Nazism you know that that did go back in a in my mind, not favorable way to some of the principles, but I'm just trying to draw a parallel. You know, at some point we're going to run out of time periods where you can say, and they went at, back to the ancient texts. Is that correct? Or can you just keep doing it? No, but I, I would say, to that I would say that uh, it's something that the intellectuals in a period do as they try to solve modern problems. But in the example that you raise, you're talking about more about social movements than you are about intellectual movements, even though, even though there were, you know, alleged attempts by early national socialists or in Italy, Mussolini to use um, some kind of contorted version of of, of Roman imperial politics as a model um, to be emulated. But it, it's a good point. We, we tend now not to do political theory on the grand scale. We, our ancients are, are usually now, and in fact, by the end of this course, by the sixth session, the, the, the sixth session, which is really going to be about uh, the rise of modern radicalism of one form or another and the rise of so-called modern conservatism of one kind or another. And, and we will see how theories that come out of the enlightenment are our ancient world. That you'll find the William Buckley's, you know, quoting uh, Edmund Burke and quoting David Hume. And you will find modern radicals, quoting Maximilian Robespierre, <laughs> you know, and we'll take a look at that. So our ancient world is a more recent ancient world, perhaps. Right. Okay. I knew you would run out of going back to the ancients. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Anybody else? Again, I, I always wind up after these first sessions of apologizing for the, sort of the, the massive uh, brain dump that becomes the one hour and 15 minute world walkthrough of six centuries of European intellectual life. But I hope I, I created some sense of order to it. I think you actually put it very succinctly and I actually could follow you. So that was terrific. Hey, thank I you. I like that. I like that. Thank you. Anyhow, with that done, we've got about two minutes. Um, thanks for being here, gang. Uh, this time next week, I will, of course, for people who haven't taken these before, within about two days, um, the video of this will have been edited to the core lecture period and, and posted on the town YouTube site. And I will email everyone the link to that. And I will also send them an accumulative as we go through the course, I will send the slide deck cumulative to whichever class we're in. So, Tonight, I'll send you session one. Next week, I'll send you one. That will be session one and two, et cetera, as we go through. And then after the sixth session, you'll get the entire deck of 
90 something slides and we're off to the races. Anyhow, uh, we, we, I noticed that some, there had been some chats. Oh, good. And by the way, thank you, Opera Guy, for reminding me that the recording wasn't on, or else this would have been a fiasco. Anyhow, uh, see you next week, gang. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Lou. Bye-bye, Lou. Thank you.